more plastic than we produced in the whole of the century that preceded. And most of that material is going to make throwaway items that are then ending up in landfill of the ocean. You guys have been hanging out here on the beach. 80% of all marine debris actually starts from a land-based source. All drains do lead to the ocean. We dump things, they end up going down a storm drain or into a wetland, going down streams and rivers straight into the Atlantic or Pacific Ocean. Camilo Beach has a very white sand look and it's not really sand at all, it's mostly white plastic covering the beach, sometimes up to a foot thick of plastic pieces. Wait a second, this is Hawaii? I've seen pictures of Hawaii. This is not what a beach in Hawaii is supposed to look like. There's just far too much of it in our ocean right now, and what is washing up on our beaches is a small indication of what's really out there. Mainly what we find are fragments of plastic, stuff like this. And all this debris is coming from the North Pacific Subtropical Gyre, or the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. There are actually five major gyres, swirling systems of currents in our oceans, one in the Indian Ocean, two in the Atlantic Ocean, and two in the Pacific Ocean. The gyre that has been studied the most is the North Pacific Subtropical Gyre, otherwise known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, estimated to be anywhere from twice the size of Texas to the size of the entire United States. Debris of all kinds floats into this gyre and there it stays, swirling. Now the problem is that when this debris is made of plastic, it doesn't biodegrade, it photodegrades. That means that sunlight breaks it down into smaller and smaller pieces, which marine life can mistake for food. So what exactly does this garbage patch look like? We went to the Algalita Marine Research Foundation for some answers. They have spent over a decade studying plastic in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. It's not a floating island of trash that can be cleaned up or scooped out. It's way worse than that. It's tons of little bits of plastic floating underwater, like a plastic soup. Uh, we've been finding more plastic by weight than plankton, and the ratio keeps going up. That's our concern. Over the years, they have seen in their trawls through the patch plastic to plankton ratios that have gone from 6 to 1 to as high as 40 to 1. What that means is that in some parts of the ocean, there is now 40 times more plastic than food. No bueno. This is Midway Atoll, a tiny speck of land in the middle of the Pacific Ocean where plastic is having a direct impact on the fate of the Lazen Albatross. Midway Atoll National Wildlife Refuge is home to the largest albatross colony in the world. These birds are fantastic flyers. They forage throughout the Pacific. But because they forage so far, they're really good indicators of the health of the Pacific and what's happening out there. In the 1950s, when people looked at dead albatross at Midway, they didn't see any plastic at all, and it wasn't until the 60s we started to see it at Midway and in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Every dead bird at Midway has plastic in them. The albatross that are surrounding us here today face numerous threats over the course of their life to successfully come back here and have chicks of their own. They've got to fly hundreds of miles to find food. They've got to survive for several years at sea. And the plastics in the ecosystem are just another hurdle in that path to come back here. All the plastic that you see here was brought to the island by an adult albatross and fed to a chick. We can calculate how much plastic is brought to Midway each year by the adult albatross, and it comes out to be five tons of plastic. That's every year, five tons. But what's happening to Midway will soon be happening around the globe unless we change the way that we operate as a people. And he totally agrees. He thinks that was very well stated, I know. It's not just albatross that are feeling the effects of plastic in our oceans. Over 260 marine species are being impacted by plastic 
either through ingestion or entanglement. This 26-foot-long bride's whale was stranded on a beach in Australia and died. It was found that the whale's stomach was packed with over 19 square feet of plastic. In fact, it is estimated that plastic kills 100,000 marine animals each year. Just about every big animal in the ocean is down 90%. The animals aren't going to be fine unless we, unless we figure out how to, how to help them. But imagine if every morning your breakfast was a bowl of cereal and half the stuff in the bowl was little styrofoam balls and half of it was cereal. In some parts of the ocean, there's enough plastic out there that animals are eating a lot of it and it's, it's not good. Sea turtles are fascinating animals that have been on our planet since the time of the dinosaurs. But now, all sea turtle species in U.S. waters are listed as threatened or endangered under the Endangered Species Act. They just eat what's out there. And not that long ago, everything that they would find was edible, or at least biodegradable. If you can envision what a plastic bag would look like floating in the ocean, it looks like a jellyfish. And many sea turtle species eat jellyfish. When scientists are conducting necropsies, which are animal autopsies, they're finding that sea turtle stomachs are full of tiny little pieces of plastic. Some sea turtle species, like the Pacific leatherback, it's estimated that they could go extinct within the next couple of decades. We're really in a position where every dead sea turtle counts, and we need to do whatever we can to keep them alive and to recover healthy sea turtle populations. We need help from, from industry and people involved in product and packaging design to help with material reduction. Reducing the quantities of plastic that we use for single-use, one-trip items, and then they're thrown away. And that's, to my mind, you know, a third of all the plastics we make, that's what we're using them for. That's the area that really needs to be targeted if we want to help to reduce the problems of uh, contamination of the marine environment. Nature solves its problems, and if we're a problem, nature will solve us as a problem. To be an environmentalist, to be a conservationist, is really a question of self-preservation. We're really working to make sure that we survive. The Earth will survive, but if we don't learn to live in harmony with its ecosystem, then we will simply disappear. Even though we can't clean up what's already in our oceans, we can make sure that we do all we can to not add more to it. Can I use my own container? Yes. Yeah. Okay. If plastic is affecting our oceans so dramatically, could it be impacting human health? And what about our child? I'll take the uh, free-range chicken. You know, I've never been one of those people that worried about chemicals and toxins and stuff. I thought it was a little bit overboard. But when you're going to have a baby, you do start to worry about that kind of thing. And you start to look around your house at the stuff that you have, the stuff that's for your baby, that's gonna go on your baby's skin, and the stuff that people start giving you for your baby. I don't even know what kind of chemicals are in this stuff. All day long, you're getting exposed to very small amounts of many different things. And each industry will say, oh, it's just a little bit of our chemical. But the problem is, we think the cumulative impact during that whole day is what's causing that health effect in the human. Basically, there are no requirements for testing chemicals for health and safety effects. The current regulation is so weak that the EPA tried to use this law to ban asbestos, and they failed. There's something like 125,000 chemicals registered for use around the globe, and very few have been tested for their effects on human health. The Europeans put in the program REACH, where chemicals had to be proven safe instead of the reverse, where in our system, first they have to be proven harmful. So chemical is innocent until proven guilty. In this country. In this country. Yeah. Maybe we shouldn't give chemicals the kind of rights that people get. <laughs> the chemicals we're testing for now include phthalates, which are chemicals that are used to soften plastic, bisphenol A, which is a chemical used to harden plastic, 
Phthalates and bisphenol A have been getting a lot of attention lately because they're both known as endocrine disruptors, meaning they disrupt or inhibit our normal hormone function. Let's start with bisphenol A, otherwise known as BPA, which is a synthetic estrogen. BPA is the main component of polycarbonate, the hard clear plastic sometimes used to make such items as water bottles, food storage containers, sports equipment, and electronics. But wait, there's more. So you think you'll avoid plastic and you'll do the right thing and you'll buy something that comes in a can and then you find out that the can is lined with, guess what? You got it, plastic. And this plastic that lines this very can contains bisphenol A which means it also lines soda, juice, and beer cans. And guess what else BPA is in? Infant formula can liners and baby bottles. That's right, baby bottles. Bisphenol A exposure at phenomenally low doses during the early period after birth when babies are drinking infant formula laced with bisphenol A out of baby bottles made from bisphenol A. What you get is animals that are hyperactive and show learning impairment. Reminds you of a human condition called attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. This is a poster chemical for that. Basically, we have released a lot of chemicals into the environment that can interfere with the way our children are constructed from the moment of fertilization until they're born 38 weeks later not only health-wise, but also in the way they behave and in their intelligence. Academic and government scientists are showing an array of harm of bisphenol A that is frightening to the brain, to the reproductive system. And one of the things you see happening with bisphenol A is gender neutrality. That means our boys are becoming feminized and our girls are becoming masculinized. And furthermore, many scientists believe that BPA exposure is linked to prostate cancer, breast cancer, hypospadias, low sperm count, early puberty, uterine fibroids, miscarriage, polycystic ovary disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes, ADHD, and autism. Right now, it is predicted that one out of every third child, and if you're a minority, it's one out of every two children born, is going to develop diabetes sometime in their life. Autism, one in 150 children. This can't be genetic because it's happening too fast. And in most instances, they were rare disorders before the 1970s. Of the more than 200 government-funded studies, 92% show harm related to BPA exposure. Of the less than 20 studies funded by chemical corporations, 0% show harm. A Centers for Disease Control study detected BPA in the urine of 95% of adults sampled. Those with the highest levels had more than twice the risk of heart disease and diabetes. Scientists have measured BPA in the blood of pregnant women, in umbilical cord blood, and in the placentas, all at levels demonstrated in animals to alter development. The American Chemistry Council says BPA is safe. We're calling Rob Krebs from the American Chemistry Council.